in March or April of this year. Um, you know, we're in a place now where those are maturing, but it's a little late to get those started because as it gets warm, uh, these plants uh, sometimes get stressed um, by the warm weather. Some of them will become bitter. So, you know, it's probably a little late to start those for spring, but the great thing about cool season crops is we actually have two cool seasons in winter. So if you didn't get, you know, your beets started already and, and you still have some of your beet seeds hanging around, um, you know, in late July or August, you can start some of those seeds and you can plant those in August, you know, for a harvest in September or October. So you can do that again uh, later in the season, right? And so yeah, and as it gets warm over the next few weeks and months, um, you know, these might start to decline. And like I said, take on a bitter taste. Um, I picked some of my, um, a little bit of my cool season crops. I have some, some little tiny um, turnips that I picked today because um, I was thinning those out. Um, and uh, they're also delicious when they're very small. So you get that chance to thin things. That's a, that's a separate crop. And if you ever have to pay for baby vegetables, those are very expensive. So thinning vegetables is also a way to have a very fancy salad at lunch, right? So we are pretty much now into our warm season. Um, and this past week or so, extremely warm season. Um, but at any time, any year, this would typically be our warm season. And this is when um, we're getting the chance to plant things that are sensitive to frost. So these are things that um, will be damaged, not just by freezing, but by, you know, frost temperatures. So, and these are plants that if you plant them, you know, when the soil is cooler, the seeds may not germinate. Um, they might stay around in the soil for longer and have the opportunity to have some sort of rot problems. Um, these will germinate best when the soil temperatures are at least 60 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. Um, and you'll know these, if you look at the back of a plant package, it may not say cool or warm, but if it's warm, it will say plant outside after all danger of frost has passed. If it's cool season, it will say something like, you can work this as soon as the soil is worked. So that is workable. So that will kind of tell you that difference between whether it's a cool or warm season. You know, our warm seasons are, you know, many of our classic garden vegetables like beans, cucumber, squash, tomato, eggplant, and peppers. Um, and then also, you know, many of our, our favorite uh, annuals like zinnias, petunias, and patience, and geranium. So how do we know? So we have data from many years going back. So we calculated this historical data to, to have an idea of when that last um, frost date is going to be in different areas. And the frost free dates for different areas of Michigan, you can look at this list. I mean, you can see they vary quite a bit. Uh, folks up in Houghton can have a frost up until July. Uh, so growing tomatoes in Houghton is, is, a, is a bit like it's a little garden gambling. You might get them, you might not. Sometimes mother nature is kinder to, to their youper, our youper friends than other years. Uh, uh, but um, as you can see, um, and in, you know, in Pontiac, um, the frost-free date is um, it's May 29th, um, and that's probably a, you know within that applies uh, for all of Oakland County. Um, you know, we're getting pretty close to that, and you know, we can see that there's not a you know we're supposed to get a little cooler this week, but we can see that there's not a lot of frost going um, predicted. So uh, we can go ahead and um, plant things you know, now, um, even though we're not exactly to our frost free date yet, but we can, we're probably safe to go ahead and do that. And I hope so, because my tomatoes are already outside in their containers. But, um, but yeah, so that's statistically the last date that we're likely to get a frost. So when seeding any of these things outdoors, so whether it's in a ground or container, um, you know, this is a, a really great project for seeds, you know, direct seeding. So putting that seed in the ground and letting that grow. Um, this is a really great for seeds that germinate quickly. So the time it takes for a seed to germinate and grow can vary from, you know, as little as uh, five or six days to, to a, you know, to 10 to 14 days to some that might take weeks. Um, 
There are some perennial plants that might take an entire season to, to germinate. They might need special cold treatment. But vegetables are usually, you know, seven to 21 days. There's some range in there. Um, and the ones that germinate on that shorter end are the ones that are a lot easier to do outside. Um, if you think about um, outside, think about the temperature fluctuations we've had over the last couple of weeks, you know, we might have in the next few weeks because that's what weather does. Um, trying to maintain consistent moisture and um, consistent conditions over that time can be a little bit of a challenge outdoors. Um, but these ones that germinate more quickly are easier. I also personally always appreciate direct seeding really big seeds, right? So you germinate a squash or a bean, you don't lose that in the weed, right? You know where you left, you know where you left them. Uh, some of those lettuce seeds are a little tricky sometimes to tell apart from all the little other tiny things that are coming up. Um, but yeah, and then like I said, when you put a seed in the ground, you need to supply that consistent temperature, um, the consistent moisture uh, that are needed for those seeds. Seeds themselves are very nice um, and relatively stable, um, basically storage for a small embryonic plant, right? So if you open up a seed inside, it's a little, it's a little plant and, and some seeds can last for years, some can last for decades. Um, and that's, like I said, they're pretty stable, but once you get them wet, and that little embryo starts to grow and it starts to break down what's inside of the seed, you're now on a one way street and you can't go backwards. So you have to, so you are now no longer taking care of a seed, you're now taking care of a little tiny fragile plant. So once you supply that moisture, you need to keep going. And a lot of the information that you'll need for starting in particular seeds would be on that seed packet. So tell you whether that's cold or warm season, we'll tell you how long that germination time is. Um, we'll also tell you something very important, which is how far apart to put plants. And um, when you're starting little tiny plants, it's very hard to believe how big they will get in a very short period of time. And um, we can also tell you when you can expect the harvest. So if you want to get tomatoes as soon as possible, you know, you wanna look at the different varieties and see which ones have the shortest time to harvest. We are also fortunate in Michigan to have an amazing um, opportunity to buy many plants that other people have started for us from seed, which uh, can save us a lot of time and can really jumpstart that uh, garden season. Um, when you're choosing plants, um, you can, you know, very gently pull a plant up out of a pot. You don't want to damage it, um, but it's a good time, time to take a look at the roots. So, um, well, this one happens to have very nice, healthy looking white roots. Not all roots are white, um, but there's no roots that should be mushy. So if it looks mushy or slimy, that is a, certainly something to be concerned about. Now look around the plant, look for signs of disease or damage or insects and pick the plants that are the most compact. Um, so tall plants that are very leggy may not have gotten a lot of light. They might've been competing with other plants and they may not um, stand up well when you take them outside. And then the other thing is if you're picking out vegetable plants, sometimes it's kind of tempting to pick the vegetable plants that are already flowering or maybe even fruiting because it kind of feels like you're getting a head start. But most of our vegetables really shouldn't be doing that, especially when they're very small. And those are plants that are maybe experiencing a little bit of stress. So those may not be the healthiest plants. They may never really get established. They may never really get the chance to produce like you would like them to. So go ahead and and um, pick the plants that are nice and compact and are not yet, you know, setting any sort of fruit. When you take plants um, into the garden, um, there's a, something that you need to do called hardening off, right? So plants that are outside are facing all sorts of stressors, uh, light, heat, wind, insects, diseases. I mean, it's a really kind of a wild world out for them, out there for them, and they need a chance to adapt to that. Um, and if they've been starting off in a very protected conditions, you know, think about the air, you know, if you've been, if you started them inside your own home earlier this year, or you started them in a greenhouse, they may not have experienced air movement. Um, you know, they may have not, ha especially if you started them indoors and you, in your own home and you started them with supplemental light, they're not experiencing nearly the light conditions that they will eventually need to adapt to outside. So hardening off is the chance to give plants um, give plants that chance to adapt to being outside. Um, and if you are moving from, say, you know, a residence with some supplemental light to outdoors, you're probably going to need to take about two weeks to do this. 
you know, something's growing in a really sunny greenhouse, you may, might need a little bit less time if they've been getting a lot of intense light already. Um, but you start them in a protected spot for about an hour outdoors and then slowly increase that time um, until they're outside for a few days and nights. Um, and this, a lot of times this year, the questions that we get on Ask, an ex ask Extension or a hotline, you know, are plants that are just experiencing this stress. Um, you know, they might uh, look like the plants, the pepper in this picture that has burned tips. They might have uh, those sunspots uh, from too much sunlight. Um, a lot of times tomatoes that are experiencing a lot of stress, um, the leaves will, you know, will darken or change colors. And that's just physiological stress. That's stress from, from making a really abrupt adaptation, like us going from snow to 90 degrees. That felt pretty shocking. It's kind of the same things for plants. They need a chance uh, to adapt. Even if those are the conditions they will eventually do very well in, they need a chance to adapt. All right, what's next? Um, the next thing you need to think about once you've got your plants in is watering. If you're growing vegetables, make sure you've chosen a water source that is safe for food crops. Right? You don't want to put on your lettuce uh, water that's not safe for you to drink. So that's something to think about when you're watering. Um, seeds and young seedlings are going to need to be kept evenly moist and they're one till they are established. Established plants um, typically are going to need about an inch of water per week. Um, conditions where it's hot, windy, sandy soils, you might need a little higher. Temperatures are cool. You know, you have soils that retain more moisture, and then you're going to need a little less per week. This is, uh, a rain gauge is an excellent way to spend less than $10 and to learn a lot about your plants and to make sure you keep your plant healthy. Um, the other thing is when you're watering, well, we obviously, you know, we're growing things outside. You know, it rains, plants get wet. So it's not that plants can't ever get wet, but anytime you can avoid getting them wet. So if you water up under the leaves instead of on top of the plant, um, keeping the leaves dry as much as you can, I uh, can prevent some diseases. Um, watering in the morning can help conserve water. Also gives plants a chance for that, um, any moisture that does get on their leaves to dry off as quickly as possible. And if you have dry areas, you can plant things that are drought tolerant. Um, so drought tolerant means that once they are established, you know, they can do longer periods of time without watering. Um, and that can save you a lot of time and money as, as watering can get expensive. Uh, monitor your rainfall with the rain gauge and try to keep it at about a water per week. And never be afraid to get down and poke around in the soil, right? You know, if things are, no matter what your rain gauge says, if the soil is really dry and your plants aren't, you know, go ahead and provide them water. So um, get down in there and look and see what's happening. There is no ideal watering schedule. Kind of need to learn what's happening and, and, and work with that. So fertilizers, um, if you do a soil test, that will recommend uh, the nutrients that are needed. Uh, so nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and a few of the others. Uh, the schedule of fertilizing will vary by plant. Um, and this is when you're working in you know, soil. If you are working in a potting medium of some sort, many of those contain fertilizer. So you won't need to fertilize until about two to six weeks after you plant in that medium. Um, and then the other thing is, is you know, when, when things look sick or stressed, like our first instinct is to act or to do something, don't apply fertilizers to otherwise stressed plants. And um, that can really just sort of add to that stress. So it doesn't fix things despite what the labels say and say they're plant food. It's not really food, it's nutrients. And um, especially ones that are delivered in the form of salts can add additional stress onto a plant. Um, the other thing that you'd want to do is to weed, uh, just like you're providing, you know, maybe nutrients and water to your own plants and your own seeds. Uh, there's a lot of weed seeds that are in our soil, and those are going to come right up with your plants. And especially if you are starting from seed, something that takes a little longer to germinate, and then you're going to want to get down in there and make sure those weeds don't outcompete your young seedlings. Um, 
also some weeds that especially ones that are maybe like distant cousins of plants that we grow uh, might carry diseases or insects uh, to related plants. Um, and then mulching can be very helpful, uh, particularly with certain types of weeds that grow from seed each year. You know, mulching is also helpful because it can provide organic matter and help retain soil moisture um, and moderate that soil temperature so the plants don't experience quite the dramatic swings. Um, it can also help prevent erosion. The most, and then one of the easiest things to do if you love your garden is to watch, right? Watch and take notes and pictures. Um, you know, people would always tell me to journal about my garden. And then by the time I got done and I was tired at the end of the day, the last thing I wanted to do was to sit down and write notes. But I find that if once a week I go around and I just take pictures of things and not just the pretty things, but maybe the things that aren't going so well, you know, when I scroll back through my pictures from the year before, you know, that gives me the chance to see, you know, what problems came up that I might need to avoid the next year. Um, oh gosh, it's time for, um, you know, my columbine are blooming. They bloomed this year last year at this time. And then in a couple of weeks, I'm going to have columbine sawfly larva destroying on my leaves. So I know what to look out for. And that, you know, helps me prepare, prepare for problems. Um, also, I have lots of beautiful flowers to look at in the middle of winter and remember how wonderful gardening is. Um, it's just easier to catch problems if they're caught early and you kind of know what to be looking for. And despite thinking that I'm going to remember details, I often don't. And so pictures and notes always help me remember. And in general, keeping plants healthy, making sure you put the right plant in the right place. Um, it won't fix all problems. It doesn't mean you'll never have problems, but it can start you on the path to success and avoid some of the common pitfalls. You know, watering appropriately, planting plants at recommended distance, controlling weeds, you know, monitoring for pests. And then if you do find a problem, you know, figure out what the issue is before proceeding. Our first instinct is to act and to fix things often. I really think the first step in diagnostics is just stopping and, you know, not having that impulse um, to fix or to act, you know, figuring out what the problem is. And there's a lot of things that we can do to prevent plant problems. Um, inspecting plants before we purchase them, you know, buying from businesses that are inspected um, and cleaning up after we do have diseases, you know, cleaning up after those plants. I'm um, using clean tools and pots. If we do have a disease, especially in the vegetable garden, you know, ro maybe rotate those crops around and pick some plants from a different family. And then also if you compost, um, you know, don't compost diseased plants. Home compost often doesn't get hot enough to kill those diseases, and you don't want to put those back out in your garden the next year. All right, so with that, um, I will take any questions that you have. Um, also, uh, if any of you, we do appreciate, um, so Christine, I, after I've, I'll take some questions, um, and then I'm going to give the floor to Christine, and she's going to talk about um, what we're going to be doing at the Pontiac Garden. It's going to kind of dovetail on some of the things we talked about here, doing a site assessment, choosing some plants, and trying to make things right for the conditions. Um, we do appreciate um, if people are willing to provide us with uh, some anonymous data. If you hold your um, cell phone up and just point it at that, um, it will take you to a website that has um, a demographic survey. We do appreciate anyone who takes um, that for us. All right, and with that, anybody have any questions before we move on to the garden project? Okay, well, we'll go ahead. I'll let, oh, Sophia, yes. Yes, um, my girlfriend has moved into her house and has three rhododendron in the front uh -huh. of her property, um, which seems to get some afternoon sun, um, morning shade, and what looks like to be brown spots on all of the leaves. The leaves are very yellow. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't seem to be really healthy. Um, and I'm not really sure if it's some type of bug. I didn't notice anything or if it's overwatered, but she is not very yeah. out of the gardener and she's yeah. like not watering it. 
Um, so I'm not really sure. And she didn't plan them. They've been there for many, many years prior to. So um, I can show you a photo that I have on my phone, but um, if that would be helpful. Do you have any insight maybe to what? Um, well, I mean, you know, without knowing for certain, um, you know, issue, there can be issues with things. Um, like you said, it's, it's not being watered. Um, I don't know, you know, otherwise what the, what that site is like, um, it might be something that needs supplemental water, but you know, I, I don't know for sure. Um, and off the top of my head, I, I don't know a whole lot of rhododendron, rhododendron diseases. Um, so that's the kind of question that I would probably like a chance to maybe look up a little bit before I answered, but yeah. that would be a really good question, especially since you've got some pictures and you, you did some scouting, so you didn't see any, it's any obvious mm -hmm. insect. Um, but yeah, that would be a really good one to put into ask extension. Um, right. and, uh, <laughs> decent chance I might actually get it, um, but I can sit and I can, you know, um, if I know what the, you know, once I know what the plant is, I can look up what some of the disease options are for that um, and then investigate it further. But yeah, okay. off it's, um, rhododendron diseases are not like on the top of my brain. So yeah. Okay. All right. I don't want to give you bad info. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Sophia, if I could just butt in. <laughs> Certainly. Um, my brother grows a lot of rhododendrons and um, <clears throat> they tend to be um, plant, they're beautiful, beautiful plants, but they, they do need um, some protection. So if your friend has removed say a tree or you know something that uh, allows a lot more sun or wind to affect those rhododendrons, um, that could uh, definitely stress them out. Um, another thing um, that you might consider with rhododendrons is to mulch them uh, to help them conserve water. Uh, they don't like wet feet, but they do need pretty consistent moisture. Um, okay. So just, just check with your girlfriend to see if she removed a tree or a wall or something. Yeah, I'll, I'll check with her. That's a good thing to think about too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And are they, are they an evergreen rhododendron? Like, do they keep their leaves mm -hmm. all winter? So sometimes those large leafed um, plants that are evergreen are more susceptible to winter damage um, because especially if they're facing like west or I'm sorry, uh, uh, south facing um, yeah. because they get that's they get, you know, afternoon sun in the winter and that yeah. warms them up. Um, can warm up some of the temperatures and that can then, you know, warms up some of the temperatures while it's still overall cold. Um, right. And that leaves them more susceptible some of that evergreen, uh, large leaf evergreen susceptible to, to winter damage, whereas things with uh, smaller leaves like yews and pines that, that might not have quite that, that issue. So yeah. Okay. I'm not sure exactly what way <laughs> this facing. So I'm like trying to figure it out. But once I yeah. get there um, over the weekend, I'll try and figure that out and take yeah, a Those are all good things to, it's kind of like solving a puzzle or Mm -hmm. is sort of putting all of those things together so yeah, yeah. but thanks christine for adding Thank some you. to that oh. all right okay well christine i will let you take the floor i think i stopped sharing so all oh, yours next. you're muted not anymore <laughs> okay let me try to share my screen there we go Okay, um, let me get this in the right mode, I think. There we go, okay. So um, some of you may be aware that um, there have been some plantings at the Pontiac Public Library in the past, um, but um, they're gonna try again. <laughs> and um, what we wanna do is, I, I am especially interested in developing some learning gardens at Pontiac Public Library because um, I am working with some folks that are trying to uh, get a Pontiac uh, farmer's market uh, started uh, at the um, 
Pancake Pavilion right behind the library. It's actually, I think, I believe part of the library. And um, I think that that will, you know, draw in a lot of people and give us a lot of opportunities to do some really cool educational things. Um, so that's, uh, and plus, um, I love Pontiac. I think Pontiac is a cool place. And um, I really want to develop more volunteer opportunities there. Another really cool thing that's going on in Pontiac that you might not be aware of is uh, St. Joe's Hospital is starting a farm. Uh, right there, right next to Pontiac, you know, right next to St. Joe's Hospital, um, uh, right in the city. I'm um, on the wellness committee for that. Awesome, awesome, good for you. Yeah. Well, we're, we're really trying to hope to develop some synergy here between that that's going on and, you know, this library. So um, uh, we do need some help uh, getting this library or this, this these low, growing gardens, learning gardens, sorry, up and going. Um, so if in the event you don't know where the Pontiac Library is, uh, it is in downtown Pontiac. It is, hopefully you can see the little red spot there. And um, it faces Woodward. So as you're, you know, flying past, <laughs> going 40 miles an hour, you might happen to notice it or see it. Um, an easier way uh, to access the parking lot is uh, through Pike Street or through South Mill Street. You can also do it through Water Street. Um, and the, uh, the pancake pavilion, or I, I believe it's just called the pavilion now is located, uh, behind the library, um, closer to Mill Street. Um, we, uh, have talked about developing these, uh, Pontiac Library Learning Gardens, and we've talked about doing it in two different phases. Um, and basically, they're going to be in 2021 or 2021, however you call it, and also in 2022. Um, phase one in 2021, in other words, this summer, um, we want to plant and maintain some drought tolerant plantings in 14 of those huge uh, cement uh, containers in front of the library. Uh, to um, draw attention to the library, to make it look pretty. Um, Lori and I were even talking about planting some really cool tall grasses, you know, that would grab a lot of attention. Um, but uh, that's what we have planned for 2021. And then um, some of the volunteer opportunities that will, is uh, just to be on the team, uh, we're going to need some site evaluations so that we can choose appropriate plant material to put in those containers. We're gonna to need to install the plant material and we're gonna to need to water and maintain these plantings throughout the growing season. Um, and you know, hopefully you're familiar with when you put um, uh, new plantings in a container, especially if it's out in the sun a lot, they require a lot of watering. So that's gonna be the the primary um, task, I believe, uh, when we first install these plantings. And um, the library staff will be around and they can kind of oversee things, but they're not going, they do not have time uh, to water the plants. So that would be entirely up to volunteers. And then in phase two in 2022, if we can get a good team developed and uh, if we get consistent volunteer participation, uh, we want to install, plan an installation of a pilot educational demonstration vegetable garden for 2022. Uh, and we wanna do it with automatic irrigation, with an automatic irrigation system. So um, we would have to do a little bit of fundraising for that. Um, but it's, you know, getting out there every day uh, to, to water is a challenge. Um, some of the opportunities that will come uh, with these um, learning demonstration gardens is we will need a team leader because for the first year in 2021, I will provide some scheduling and leadership, but um, I'm not gonna continue to do it. 
Uh, we're hoping to get, um, you know, uh, a gun ho volunteer who can help us with that. Um, in the fall and the winter um, of 2021, we're going to develop a plan and a budget. And then we're going to have to fundraise for that budget. Uh, the library is willing to kick in some funds. Um, and then uh, in the spring of 2022, uh, we want to install the garden. And then we want to have our first hands-on educational garden program for the 2022 Pontiac Farmers Market opening, which will probably be either in late July or, or I'm sorry, excuse me, late June or early July. And then we want to continue with maintenance and educational programming. And if things are going really well, we can plan to expand in 2023. So those are some of the things that are available if you would like to get involved. Um, like I said, this first year, we're just gonna be concentrating on um, making the place prettier, um, developing a team, and um, like I said, if, that, if those efforts are successful, then we will uh, go on and um, develop a teaching garden. And we really hope to have a lot of hands-on um, educational programming out in that garden. That's kind of the whole point. Um, through both through the library, through the farmer's market, and through MSU Extension, and maybe hopefully even in a partnership with other groups such as Growing Pontiac or um, St. Joe's Hospital. Um, so that is the end of my presentation. Um, I hope I got you somewhat interested. Uh, if you have any questions, now's a great time to ask. Um, you can either unmute yourself and just go ahead and ask, or if you're really shy, you can put it in the chat box. Yeah, the chat box. Okay. Oh, and if somebody wants to type a question on Facebook too, if you're watching on Facebook, hey. um, I'm answering questions there as well. Has there been any connection or um, reach out to Open University regarding this as well? Because I know that Open University um, Public Health Department actually had a grant um, come in like two years ago for uh, Healthy Pontiac. And I know that they were reaching out to St. Joe's and a lot of um, community organizations um, and stakeholders to be able to make things like this happen. Is that something that has been considered or um, pursued yet? Not yet, but that's a really great idea. Um, and I know some of those people because I'm on the um, Oakland County Food Policy Council. Mm -hmm. So um, I will definitely connect with them and, and see what we can do to uh, collaborate on that. If you need contacts or of the like, I can get those to you. Great. Um, and you know, I meant to put my contact information up here, and of course I didn't, um, which is probably the most important thing to put up there. Um, let's see, yeah, I didn't do it. <laughs> anyway, um, I can tell you my, um, my email can you, address. Can you type it into the chat? It'd be easier. Yes, I could. What a great idea. Boy, I'm glad some people are here and on top of it. Um, yeah, let me find how to find my chat thing. I have to stop sharing, I think, to do that. Um, okay, Let's to everybody. Okay, uh, my name is Christine Hahn. I am an extension educator. Uh, let's see. Oh, good one. Uh, here's my um, my email. It's Han H A H N K at msu dot edu. Um, and if you're inclined to call, you can reach me at two four eight eight zero two four five nine zero. 
And we'll put that um, afterwards, we'll put that on the, this is a Facebook recording of this, so people can watch it later on the Pontiac Library site. Okay. So we'll put that there. And if you are an extension master gardener, this will be in the project connection. So we'll have a description of the project and contact information posted there. Well, thank you. Hi, I, I, I have a question. Sure. Uh, when uh, do you plan on starting this? Uh, we plan on starting it in June, probably the second week. Um, it's going to depend on how much interest there is and how many people we hear from. Okay. And uh, so like the second week in June, you said? Yes. And meet at the library? Um, we will, uh, like I said, people who um, are interested uh, can contact me. And okay. we'll develop a date and a time and all that stuff. But um, I don't know if we're going to meet at the library. We may have to do it online for a little while. Okay. Um, but eventually, obviously, you know, to do the gardening stuff, we're going to have to meet at, at the library. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes. Uh, but, yeah, I, ideally, I would like to have a meeting um, after Memorial Day weekend and then to get going uh, the week after that. And so if you've got um, ideas about um, some drought tolerant plantings that you think would do well there, uh, bring them with you. Um, I have some ideas, but you know, that's only if nobody comes up with anything else. <laughs> big blue stem. <laughs> yeah, big grasses. Big grasses. Um, yeah. We'll uh, just pull them out of somebody's yard. Well, you, yeah. have to, you have to get permission first. <laughs> no, I mean, people people that are working with it might have grasses they want to get rid of because yeah, they're overtaking. They, yes, they do need to be uh, divided fairly regularly. Um, right. And that's a, good, that's a good way to do at least the first year without causing too much financial hardship. Okay. All right, Becky Eli has put her information in the chat. I appreciate that. Um, anybody else who wants to put their information in the chat, chat is welcome to do so. Um, and we will record it and uh, we will contact you after Memorial Day and um, you know, uh, set up a, a meeting. All right, so I think we're good. That's all I've got. That's all Christine's got. Gregory, did you want to say anything to wrap up? No? Okay. Well, no, I just okay. want to say it was very interesting. I'm excited uh, to find out about this and to um, have Pontiac Library involved in it too. So. Yeah. Hopefully I'll hear some more about this as it goes on because I am a big fan of growing things. Cool. I've got plants in my house and they've done well for a long time and I haven't thought much about it, <laughs> but apparently I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Good to hear. Good to hear. Okay, so you've got uh, my contact information. Please contact me if um, you are interested in um, being involved. Um, and, you know, I didn't mean to try and scare you off or anything. I, I don't expect people to be out there every day watering, um, or at least not one person. Hopefully we can get a group of people involved and then, you know, many, pay, many hands make light work. So um, come on out. It'll be, I'll try to make it fun. <laughs> Uh, Christine, I sent you an email with uh, one of my professor's contacts. Okay, great. Thank you. Contact information too. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. You are interested in um, okay. being involved. Thanks, Laurie. Um, Wonderful. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation, Laurie. That was great.